Hi, I'm with Seam, CEO of Pilot. Thanks for joining us. I have with me today Hans Robertson. Hans is the founder of Meraki, the first enterprise cloud-managed networking solution that today has over 230,000 customers. Cisco acquired Meraki for $1.2 billion in December 2012. Hans subsequently started Verkata, a cloud-managed security camera company, and he's an active angel investor. Hans, thanks for being with us today. Looking forward to it. So Hans, as a founder of two successful startups, Meraki and Verkata, you've seen the path of these companies from the beginning all the way to real success. Something many founders ask us is, in the very, very early stages of the company, what are the things they should be putting into place from kind of a finance or internal operations side? Sure. Well, um, I think as with most things related to the early stages, getting you know the best people involved is probably you know, one of the most important aspects. Uh, the, even on the finance side, I think in the early stages, you're not going to want your own finance team. It just doesn't make sense. But getting a reasonably good accounting firm or good accounting firm just to take that whole element of the business off your mind is probably one of the, the best things to do early on. And how do you think about like tasks that are good to continue being done in-house versus tasks that are good to outsource along these lines? Yeah, I mean, I think in the early stages for most, certainly, you know, software or tech companies, you don't really want to spend a lot of time thinking about finance. So, you know, I guess I would sort of bias towards doing as little as possible. You know, certainly uh, having the founders and executives spend not a whole lot of time on, on finance, um, unless your business is kind of somewhat strange and requires that. But I think for your typical, you know, kind of even consumer or SaaS company, it, it you know, you just don't want to spend time thinking about it. You want to, you know, let's just say something like expenses. You sort of want the classic, like, well, I haven't really done anything in a month, but here's a pile of receipts, like, have someone go deal, because you don't really want to be sitting in there and you're expensify, like, categorizing which receipt is for, you know, gas and which one's for, you know, postage. I mean, it's like, you don't want to be doing that kind of stuff. So you really want somebody who can absorb, um, you know, most of the, the hours uh, without you having to really do much. Sure. Yeah, it makes total sense, which is, mm -hmm. I think one of the things we've thought about in general is what are the things that are actually high leverage for the founders to be doing that they're going to be able to do better than anyone else, and what are the things that are not, and for the things that are not, those strike me as good candidates mm -hmm. to try to bring in external providers on. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the elements of finance that, that are important to think about is, like, cash. You know, uh, sure. uh, the only way companies really die is they, they run out of money, right? Um, so I think having a firm grasp of what the cash flow needs are like today and what they're likely to be over the next six to 12 months so you can, you know, basically calibrate your fundraising appropriately makes tons of sense. I mean, it seems obvious, but, you know, having a firm grip on what's going to happen to cash flow is probably something that's actually worth, you know, spending time on. Um, and then, of course, is the whole you know venture funding side. That's not really the topic of our discussion, but I think you know being pretty good at you know understanding how the venture game is played is also important. Sure. Yeah. And in terms of kind of financial metrics that you think founders should be keeping their eyes on, do you think it's like cash position and burn rate? Do you think something more fancy is required, or how do you think about how founders? Should yeah, be I mean, I, I guess my instinct is that it it, uh, it sort of depends on what kind of business you're in. Mm -hmm. um, and there are even within categories of business that are just management philosophies. You know, for example, in the case of Meraki, I think we, we were pretty careful to run a high margin, you know, relatively conservative cash burn type of business. Um, but one of our, you know, competitors, uh, Ubiquity, who ended up not really being a competitor, but in the early stages was, I mean, they, they raised no venture money, so they were like cash flow positive, which is a completely different, you know, route to success, and that, that company's done great. Um, and then there are other companies I might put, you know, like Box in this example, which just, you know, have a really high burn, don't really optimize margins until, you know, a long, long time down, and that's also a successful strategy. So I, I think it, there's a combination of like, what kind of business am I in, as well as what's my general approach? Am I going to just burn as quickly as possible to, to grow revenue? Don't care about things like, you know, operating margins or sales efficiency. Am I going to, you know, be in a business where um, 
you know, I, I really want to make sure that I can show investors that I have a high gross margin, so I am going to you know, pay attention to that. So I think there's a lot of variance there. And I don't mean to kind of punt the question, but I think you should think about it and, and understand that your decisions around uh, things like efficiency and margins are sort of an it depends type of question. Sure. So depending on the needs of the business, you may want to track these certain metrics and therefore you may want tooling in place to kind of make that that easier. Or you may sure. decide that actually it's not relevant for the stage of the business. Right. The only thing we're focusing on is growth and of course not r running out of money. Right, right. And I'll give you another example there. So in the case of uh, Vercada, this you know, is a systems company, that business really should run at a pretty high margin. And so you don't want to put in place a uh, business process and a way of selling where that company runs at you know, like a 30% gross margin because that's just not really where it needs to be. So in that case, yeah, you would want to keep, keep your eye on gross margins. Um, for most SaaS companies where margins are so high, it doesn't really matter whether it's like 95 or 85%, like probably not a, a metric worth optimizing. And, yeah. and when do you think is the right time to think about those kinds of questions? Like they've got, you know, it's, let's say it's two founders, they've just raised a seed round. Do you think that's a time when they should really start to be concerned about some of these, some of the metrics of the business, or do you think that's something they can defer to the A or even beyond? Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, speaking generically, um, I think it's probably worth having a sense of, you know, what <clears throat> some metrics are, uh, and not spending necessarily time optimizing them, but at least knowing. I mean, I think if if you're the CEO of a startup and someone asks you what's your burn rate, you know, you sort of you have to you know should the know. answer that question. Yeah. Uh, I think other questions that you really should know are, um, you know, what's your plan for the next six to 12 months when it comes to you know, bookings or revenue and, and cash burn? Um, questions around gross margin may or may not be relevant, but seem like it's a pretty basic number. You should probably know what that is. Um, those are some of the basics that I think I would think about even relatively early. Sure. Yeah. And at the seed stage, are there particular processes or systems that you'd want to put into place from an inter internal tooling perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think um, having uh, basic financial statements that are competently prepared is always something you want. I mean, investors are going to want to see that. It's a useful discipline. So I think you don't want to go too long without basically having, um, you know, a, a reasonably accurate income sheet balance statement, cash flow statement, and a model around your business. Could be a simple Excel model, but those are probably some of the, the early things that you want to do. And from a software perspective, do you think like something like QuickBooks is sufficient there? Or do you think they need to do something bigger in the early stages? I or? would definitely not do anything more complicated than um, QuickBooks or its equivalent, zero, et cetera, in the early stages for a couple of reasons. One, um, those systems really want a dedicated person in-house to set them up. Um, they're more complicated to set up. And I think you, you don't want to get locked into a certain type of system before your business has had a chance to mature somewhat um, because it's just going to be another thing that makes it hard to change. You know, And you want to, in the early stages of any startup, I think you want to be flexible. Um, and uh, accounting isn't one of the things that you want to lock you into a certain way of doing things. Uh, cost is, of course, another reason, but I don't think it's the dominant reason. Um, so I think, you know, a simple, probably hosted system is the way to go. Um, I think some people might tell you that the on-prem versions are still somewhat more sophisticated, but I've seen plenty of companies use the hosted versions, even up to a couple hundred people, and I think it works pretty well. Sure. And so that's kind of at the seed stage. Now let's say the company is gone and they've successfully raised a series A, the team size is growing. Is that for you kind of an inflection point where they, you'd recommend they start to improve their financial discipline in a particular way? Um, so yeah, I think uh, the more complicated your business gets, the bigger you get, probably the more you can invest in uh, setting up more robust processes and, and so forth. Um, I think you always want to, kind of look at it like, what's the benefit? You know, what am I going to get by doing this? I think just kind of like making things more complicated for its own sake doesn't, doesn't really make sense. Um, I think what you find as the startups get bigger is it just becomes harder to kind of keep track of everything that's going on. Um, uh, and that's when you're going to want more sophisticated systems to help you do that. Um, let me give you, you know, an example. Let's say now you've got 
four or five different product lines and picking apart like exactly which one is contributing to revenue in which ways, which one's more profitable, um, you know, how much cost is being associated with them. That's a reasonable question to ask. And so, you know, you're going to want systems and people that can help you answer those types of questions. Maybe you've decided to expand internationally. That's complicated. You're going to need systems that can handle that. Um, so I think you just evolve the processes and systems, you know, depending on what the real needs are. I mean, it sounds sort of trite, but I think that's how you approach it. As opposed to a, here is a set of rules when you have 200 people, you should be doing X. I, I think I'd sort of take a more uh, first principles approach to that. Makes sense. And yeah. particularly for, for especially like first time founders or early stage, you know, executives, do you have any advice for them? They're not like IT buyers by background. Do you have any advice for them about how to think about when the right time to purchase a particular tool is or how yeah. to evaluate what level of complexity. I mean, in general, I would say like when it starts to feel broken is when you probably want to buy a new tool, but sure. don't prematurely optimize. I mean, I think in general, premature optimization is dangerous and that's true for uh, accounting and finance systems as well. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, let's say you're doing, uh, you have a sales team and you're paying sales commissions and you know, obviously everybody starts out with spreadsheets and you've got you know, 10 salespeople, you put the bookings in there, you calculate their commissions and then now you have 50 people, it starts to become a little bit more onerous. Uh, now you have 200 salespeople and it's like, man, like this is really hard to do in a spreadsheet. So I think when it becomes so painful, that's when you start looking at, okay, now we're gonna buy you know, exactly, or some other sales comp, you know, tool that plugs into Salesforce. But you really don't want to do that too early for a couple of reasons. One, those tools tend to be more complicated to actually use than, than they might appear from the outside. Sure. Uh, Excel, for all of its faults, is like a lot of people can use it. Uh, number two, um, it also reduces flexibility. Once you've gone and, you know, taken your process and essentially codified it in software, it's harder to change than like an Excel spreadsheet. So you want to proceed cautiously when it comes to, you know, investing in more sophisticated tools. But at some point you you really will need to do it because it's just so painful to keep doing it in a more manual way. And do you have feelings on when evaluating particular vendors going with what feels like the industry standard versus adopting a challenger or a new entrant in the market? Yeah, I mean, I think um, my approach to that has been uh, somebody relatively senior should actually try the software, as crazy as that, as that seems, uh, and you should be nervous when they don't let you try it. Um, I've personally experienced software where uh, I, I didn't do that or somebody on the team didn't do that, and the first time you use it, you think to yourself, oh man, like this was not a good idea. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot of time, but if you, you know, try the tool and after 30 minutes it seems modern, it seems like you know, it sort of does what you expect, that's, that's a good sign. And, and conversely, I think you can knock out a decent amount of tools just by looking at them being like, yeah, I mean, I read the marketing, the marketing all looked great, but clearly this is not very well implemented. Um, so you can tell a lot pretty quick without really needing to be a domain expert. So that's number one, I'd say just actually try it and be skeptical of a vendor that won't let you try it. I mean, if they say, oh yes, we'll do a web demo, we'll take you through it, and you say, yeah, great, thanks for doing the web demo, now like just send me a login and password, and they say, well, you know, we don't really do that. Uh, you ask again and say, yeah, yeah, but I know you don't usually, but I actually want to try it. If they refuse, I, th I think you should probably like keep looking. Sure, that probably a red sense. flag. Yeah. Well, also, I think there's probably a distinction between tools that are built for someone at the company to operate and tools or products where you also have to hire a person to operate it. Or, yeah, or install it, for example. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think there are certainly tools that are so notoriously difficult to implement that they don't really want you to try it because they're sort of trying to hide the fact that, yeah, this is probably going to take six months and, uh, you know, $200,000 to get it working. Um, you have to be really pretty big to want to bite something like that off. I think other things you can do when you're evaluating tools, um, obviously, is talk to people that are further along than you, that have gone down a particular route. I think you get a lot of information that way. And in, I think in Silicon Valley and in general, you know, there's a big enough startup community that you can usually find something. Uh, obviously, you don't just want to ask the vendor for their references because they're going to get somebody who you know, says good things all the time. Uh, so I think kind of asking around is usually something that's pretty straightforward to do unless it's some exotic thing. Um, 
and then again, just really making sure that you're at a point where you actually have to have this. Not because somebody told you that, oh, you know, when you're X number of people, you should have Y tool. Like, I, I think that's a dangerous prescription. Sure. And so, very interesting to hear your thoughts on tooling. Another thing I know we have discussed in the past is the idea of an operating plan. Do you have any guidance for startups or founders and thinking, yeah. well, look, how soon is too soon? How complex is too complex? Like, what is the right time to yeah. be thinking about that? Yeah, so that was something that actually um, at Meraki, our investors asked us to do. And uh, I have found it to be a very useful discipline. Um, you know, like once a year, you go through and you come up with uh, like a real plan for the next year. I think it ultimately gets distilled into a few slides. Um, <clears throat> presenting it to your board is a good way to kind of make everybody do it. Uh, it's sort of like having a paper deadline, you know, like when does the paper get written, you know, the day before the it's due date, sort of same thing with operating plans, but it, but it forces a, hey, we're going to come up with a plan, we're going to put it in slides, we'll have, you know, um, what are bookings and uh, expenses and cash flow going to be for the next year, what's the headcount plan look like, um, <clears throat> perhaps a fundraising isn't baked into that as well, um, and it's a chance for you know, the whole company to come together and say, hey, here's, here's what we're going to do the next year. And so, you know, to put it together, the marketing person needs to tell you, hey, how many marketing people are going to hire? How much am I going to spend on, you know, campaigns and advertising? Of course, there's going to be uncertainty. You can have, you know, version A, version B, version C, but you kind of have to get together and the same thing for the engineering head and the sales and, you know, all the other functions to come together and say, hey, this is our plan. So I think having an operating plan is useful. Um, and then, you know, you can just kind of see how you do against it. And it's something to measure yourself against. Uh, it doesn't have to take a ton of time. You know, it's like 20, 40 hours kind of thing. Uh, but I think it's useful to have one. And in terms of how that gets created, do you recommend asking the heads of each function to basically take point on their section? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, someone yeah. needs to be sort of the ringleader, you know, the, the integrator. And, but, uh, yeah, each head of a function should more or less be able to tell you, uh, hey, here's what I'm going to do over the next 12 months, 24 months. And obviously, the farther out you get, the more uncertainty there is, which is fine. And I think concretely, you know, you put that into a, a simple spreadsheet. Um, you know, here's my hiring plan. Here's my spending plan, you know, on, on the sales side, or, you know, here's the revenue plan. Um, and then boil that into a set of a model that just shows what's going to happen over the next uh, 12, 24, 36 months. And you'd mentioned that the output of this plan is often, though not always, a presentation to the board or a yeah. couple slides in the board deck. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on kind of who the right people to actually present those slides are to the board? Yeah, I mean, I think it could be either the CEO or it could be if there's one of the management team that's the obvious, you know, operations, finance, you know, kind of business person. I think it could be either one of those people. Uh, in any case, I think the CEO would want to have a pretty firm grasp of what's in there, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that person presenting it. Um, and if it's done well, it should be producing the kind of slides that people refer to, as opposed to one where it just gets done you know, once and everyone sort of forgets about it and no one remembers any of the numbers. Uh, I know that for me, the numbers that always stick out in my head are what's the bookings target? Um, and then also sort of what's the cash position. Those are really the two that I end up remembering. How much engineering is gonna spend in Q2 of 2020? Like, probably not a number I would ever remember, but the, the high level numbers are useful. And it's, it's especially useful with, if everybody has bought in and agrees that those are the goals. Because, you know, hitting a bookings target is usually pretty hard, so you want some consensus and conviction that those are worthwhile numbers to go after. Sure, that it can serve as a North Star for the team. That, right. hey, sales, <laughs> hey, marketing, hey, engineering, these are our targets. This is what we're going to do to hit them. And here it is all packaged nicely. Right. And simple. Because if it's a complicated model and a complicated set of slides with 40 different rows, kind of does you no more good than having six rows. Really. Sure. Yeah. Less is more. It's just easier to digest, easier to understand. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And then in terms of thinking about kind of going back to the finance function more specifically, in the early days, this is presumably the domain of like the CEO, the COO, like one of the founders kind of wears the finance hat. When do you think is sort of the right time to bring on the first full-time finance hire? Or what would be the trigger that would cause yeah. you to begin that search? 
I think the trigger is when your your business gets to a level of complexity and you're spending enough, someone like the CEO or the CEO is spending enough time in this area that it's becoming a meaningful percentage of time, that's when you're like, all right, we should probably get our first finance hire here. I think who that person is varies. Uh, in some cases, I've seen companies hire a, you know, someone who's maybe a controller, you know, sort of a, a more senior accounting person. I think that works. Sometimes a VP of finance, uh, rarely a CFO. Uh, probably that's not the best early stage hire. Um, and then very occasionally a more junior, like accounting type person. I think they're all possible uh, with controller being probably the most um common. And what does a controller mean? It basically means it's a person who's uh, you know, been out of school for five to 15 years, maybe a little bit more, who is really going to focus on the you know, accounting uh, expenses, kind of the do the work, but also senior enough that they could supervise a little bit, um, that type of person. Sure, about kind of producing the financials, but also managing the process, kind of get good controls into place, that yep. type of thing. They probably have a background at a you know, big five, big four accounting firm. Um, that could, yeah, something like that. Sure. And what do you think in general their focus area should be once you bring them on board? It probably depends a little bit on the business. I guess what I've seen is they they take over the kind of monthly financial processes. You know, doing the close. Um, they probably help with the planning aspect, like the the operating model we just talked about. Generally, they'll take over that spreadsheet. Um, or the process there and be the, the integrator. Uh, although that might still re remain with a COO type person if such a person exists. Um, and then they take over the daily um, finance activities that impact everybody. For example, expense reports and accounts payable, accounts receivable if you have them, hopefully you do, um, uh, and things like that. Sure. Are there places where you've seen this type of hire go wrong? And if so, is it like they hire too senior, they hire too junior? Are there particular kind of pitfalls you think folks should be looking out for? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've certainly made mistakes in this area. Um, I think that f thinking about, you know, what characteristics do you want in this first finance person? Just like the first hire in a lot of functions, whether it's engineering or sales, I mean, you really want to try to get an excellent person. Uh, and most of the time, I think founders don't really know what an excellent finance person is. Um, uh, so I think then you kind of use your general hiring tactics. I mean, did they, do they have a good background? What I mean by that is, you know, a s good schooling. Did they work at a good firm? Most importantly, do they have great back channel references when you check them out? Um, not. And no one of those things is essential, but I think you're trying to build a composite picture of this is a really highly qualified, highly motivated person who's going to um, be the, the seed person from which you know, an entire group is going to grow. And then you know, if you make a mistake, you want to recognize that mistake and, and correct it, just like with, I think with any hire. Um, so I don't have you know, specific, like it really should be this exact type of person as so much as, you know, a high quality person in general is probably where you want to start. And don't, I guess another way of putting that is, it's probably not a great idea to hire someone that you don't really think is very good thinking, well, it's just finance, so I'll kind of, you know, doesn't really matter that much. Um, because this is a person who will ultimately be hiring other people, so you, you want to be careful. Yeah, that's a great point, which yeah. is that it's the beginning of what is hopefully a finance team as the company grows and matures and and therefore, if you don't do a good job on this hire, it, right. it poisons the whole brain. And, and, and it also gets back to what we said at the beginning, which is finance is something that probably you don't want your um, senior team spending a ton of time thinking about, especially in the early stages. Um, so to the extent you get someone really good, that means they're going to be able to offload a much greater percentage of things you might otherwise have to worry about. You really just want the books to be closed by themselves. You want to assume the accounting is being done correctly. You want projections on cash flow to be pretty accurate. You want someone you can trust to tell you when something is important and needs to be fixed or that is going to go wrong. And to the extent the person is someone you really trust and is excellent, you'll get a better experience in those areas. It's interesting to hear you describe it that way because it's 
it's almost like an insurance policy, which is you want someone good who is gonna take care of this so you don't have to think about it, and that when something does go wrong or if something does go wrong, they're in a great position to really help you out or flag it for you. Yeah, sure. I mean, a great example would be, hey, listen, we said, uh, we said our you know, marketing cost was gonna run at you know, like 10% of bookings or something, but really it, it's easily gonna be 20, which directly translates into higher cash burn. Like, that you may be fine with that, but you should probably know that this is an area that's like substantially above plan. And you just kind of want to believe, okay, I, I trust this was all calculated correctly. So do I either A, want to go have a conversation with marketing about reining that in, B, say, yeah, that's fine. Let's just adjust the plan accordingly. It turns out we're going to spend a lot on marketing. Um, but it's useful if someone else is like doing the work to let you make those decisions as opposed to you having to kind of notice it and you know, do a lot of the prep work to get to the point where you can make those types of decisions. Sure, in particular because it may not even be your area of expertise. Right. Yeah. And then you'd mentioned in the early stages you probably would not bring on the CFO that that seems like a, a hire that would be too early. At what point would you consider saying, okay, the company is now at a stage where we should really bring on a full-time CFO? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably in most cases like a year or two before you think you might go public. Um, and the reason for that is that um, you know, CFOs are the most senior finance people. Um, the really good ones want to work at companies where it looks like a sure thing, uh, just like in many other, you know, functions. So, you know, I, I think I would say when you're hiring a CFO, you want to get a good one. Uh, it's very challenging to get a top-notch CFO when, you know, there's a ton of risk and uncertainty surrounding your business. If you can do it, perhaps you've worked with the person before or, uh, there's some kind of special reason why they would want to work at your business when you have 50 people and your business model is uncertain, then like, well, then great, that's fine. But I think usually to attract a top caliber CFO, you have to be on a, um, a pretty clear path towards being a big company. Sure. And do you think that's the main motivator or main driver to bring someone in is the hygiene or prep associated with the potential IPO? Yeah, I mean, certainly for an IPO, you're going to need a CFO. Um, so uh, that is a firm requirement. I think other reasons that CFO-like role is useful uh, are when your business is just getting super complicated and you need, you know, just a more senior person to help run it. Uh, let's like, what would trigger that, for example? Um, you know. Uh, more complicated structures. Now you're setting up different entities in different jurisdictions and it's getting kind of complicated. Or you have a big enough finance team that you really just want a great manager. I mean, finance team of 30 people, it's pretty big, it's getting complicated. You want someone who's you know, familiar with running a bigger team like that. Um, those would be like reasons to start looking for a more senior person. Sure. Another thing would be if you have really complicated investor base. So now you're going out and raising late stage financing, you know, outside of the venture community, someone who knows whichever community you're targeting well. I mean, I think CFOs, some of them are gonna be really good at fundraising. So that would be like another reason to think about that. Sure. Awesome, this is all really, really good stuff. Hans, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Of course, it was a pleasure.